amazing. It just gets better. Um, you know, there could not be a more accomplished, a more talented choice for the closing keynoter for 2018. Gavin Horn is not just a brilliant educator, researcher, he's an accomplished and active firefighter. He has a PhD, a doctorate, from the University of Illinois. But most importantly, he has an RWF, a real world firefighter craftsman certification he received right here at FDIC. We issue him. Gavin's a wonderful friend. He's done amazing favors for FDIC and fire engineering and the fire service. Gavin is a vintage class act. He is humble and he's quick-witted. He's confident and he's kind. He's always open, honest, and caring. I often tease my friend Gavin, seriously, take, when you see him, if you haven't never met him before, if you take a hard look at him, if they ever needed a stand-in for Tom Cruise, he's the guy, right? He's the guy, he looks, like, he looks like Maverick. We're deeply indebted to Gavin for his work in fire behavior, toxicity, cardiovascular responses, exposure issues, training issues, firefighting research, study exploration, and his service to his community and the Savoy Fire Department. Gavin's the true Renaissance man. He is never satisfied with what we know today. He's obsessed with what else there is to learn. What lies hidden? What else could we uncover? What else can we find out to make our work safer, more effective, and more efficient? He is just literally amazing. Gavin Horn has served as the director of the IFSI, that's the Illinois Fire Services Institute Research Center since August of 2004, after receiving his PhD in mechanical engineering from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Gavin's research interests focus on firefighter health and safety, first responder technology development, material testing and design, and non-destructive evaluation. He has published more than 50 peer-reviewed journal articles and given presentations at meetings, conferences, and symposia around the world. He serves as a firefighter engineer on the Savoy, Illinois Fire Department. He is one of the most eloquent and one of the most gracious presenters in the history of the fire service. Ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed my incredible pleasure and tremendous honor to introduce my good friend, Gavin Horn, to now take the stage and bring this house down as only he can with his wisdom, his insight, and his passion. Ladies and gentlemen, Gavin Horn. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> to prepare for this, uh, this incredible opportunity, I took some time to look through a bit of the history of FDIC. Pride in ownership, the true values of a fireman, leading with attitude and standing on the shoulder of giants, finding a voice for fire service progress and in the heart of a firefighter. These are just a few of the messages that this stage has seen and heard. From theory to practice and rock stars to Mrs. Smith, and from the qualities of leadership to the characteristics of followership, the ever-present struggles between tradition and progress, and from research to experience, and finally the challenges of the safety-focused to the importance of the health-conscious. What can I possibly say that hasn't been said here before? Regardless of any of the kind words from Chief Halton, to be honest, I'm just a kid from a small town in rural Illinois that has caught some amazing breaks. But that's when I realized that's probably true for most of us here today. We all started out as a kid from somewhere whose path led us to Indianapolis on April 26, 2018. We all caught breaks that changed our stories. The one thing that unites nearly all of us here today is at some point or another, we caught the most amazing break of all being introduced to the fire service and finding a passion in its duty, its honor, service, and its traditions. Of course, that calling is, is just a little bit different for each and every one of us. But if you're here today, 
you're likely one of those who has that passion. That passion to learn, to strive, to be as great of a firefighter, fire officer, or fire scientist, or fire equipment manufacturer that you can possibly see. So I want to start by asking you to think about your first break. How did you get here? How did you get to this spot today where you are? Some of you I'd consider fortunate. Your fathers, mothers, grandparents, generations in some cases, have served their communities. And you follow in your family's legacy of service. Many more were drawn into the fire service by a significant event in your life, where the fire service put out a fire, responded to a car crash, performed admirably on a medical emergency, and you realized at that moment that you wanted to be a firefighter and you wanted to serve your community. For many in my generation, that major event occurred on September 11th in 2001. I still remember as the events of the day unfolded, being terrified yet uplifted by the service of the firefighters on that day. The actions of those firefighters, many of you in the audience here today, had a profound impact. That profound impact was felt, in my case, halfway across the country, bringing out volunteer firefighters in droves, leaving a lasting impact on departments such as ours in Savoy. So we keep a plaque at our headquarters in Savoy for members who have served for the longest duration, over 10 years in some cases, and it's filled with names whose service began in 2001 and 2002. But when I think about my roots in the fire service, I actually have to track back a little bit farther to Wilbs Fix-It Shop. Wilbs was a magical place for me, just like many for you in your childhoods. And I say that as a kid who grew up as a mechanic. My parents owned a small mom and pop motorcycle shop in northern Illinois, and my very first memories were of my father lifting me up onto a workbench to spin the bolts out of a side case of a Boltaco Persang. I loved being a mechanic, even as a kid. There was, it was a beautiful thing to learn how to fix things, how to get my hands on a project and learn the value of getting a difficult and oftentimes dirty job done. See, true mechanics are craftsmen who not only know how to spin a wrench, but they know a little bit about electricity, a little bit about plumbing, welding, and just about anything that can get you out of a jam. My personal best, getting 80 miles out of my old Dodge Charger using a windshield washer system as a makeshift fuel pump. My father has never been more proud than he was at that moment. <laughs> I greatly valued the hard work embodied by the dirt and the grease and the rust on my hands after a job well done. And I had the incredible luxury of growing up, wrenching on and riding motorcycles from the time I was about three years old. So when we moved the shop to the west side of Elgin, it was really strange that I found myself drawn to the small engine repair shop that was across the street. And you might think, why would a kid who gets to play with motorcycles and ATVs and snowmobiles want to spend time with lawnmowers and chainsaws? Well, Wilbs was a magical place, not only for the everyday work they did helping people keep their lawns in beautiful shape, but there was something unique in their back bay. To me, Wilbs was a picture postcard for what's great about America a Norman Rockwell painting in real life. See, in 1971, Wilbert Westerman, Roy Kuhn, and a few others, they were faced with a problem. The area where they lived and worked at this small engine repair shop no longer had fire protection. So true to their name, they fixed it by building a bay on the back of Wilbur's Fix-It Shop to house a pumper. And it became Pingree Grove Station number three. But they didn't just build a bay on the back of the shop to house the machine. Five members of their community dedicated their personal time and energy, <clears throat> their heart and soul, to learn the art of fighting a fire when they weren't turning a wrench. So man, I tell you what, motorcycles are cool, but these guys were real life supermen. This is a place where everyday people, they go to work each day, mechanics, parts boys, shop owners, they're at work until they're called upon by their neighbors for help. They drop their tools, wipe the grease from their hands and go to the back bay where they would emerge on a shiny fire engine. When there was a problem in their community, they fixed it. But for me personally, they did much more than that. Their lessons, their dedication, and their actions left an indelible mark that has stayed with me to this day. See, the last response from Wilbs was in the late 1980s and the bell rang no more at that point. 
It was nearly 15 years before my reintroduction into the fire service. And a few years after Wilbs closed, I went off to college to become a mechanical engineer, that true enemy of all mechanics. I did it so I could teach them how to build a proper motorcycle. Well, things kind of went off the track here for a little bit, and uh, though I spent more years in college than Tommy Boy and Van Wilder combined, I eventually <laughs> found my calling back in the fire service. After many years of hard work and a little bit of fun, I completed my degree, but I was trying to figure out what to do with my life. How could I use the skills and abilities that I had to make a difference in the world and do it in a way that was consistent with what I'd learned from those people at Wilbs Fix-It Shop? That's why I was fortunate to find a profession called Fire Protection Engineering and this place called the Illinois Fire Service Institute. And that was my next big break, many years later, to discover that a passion can be reinvigorated, even after many days, after many months, or in my case, in many years, and my break came from an opportunity called the Illinois Fire Service Institute. Like so many of you who have shared this stage before me, IFSI has provided amazing grounds for cultivating a passion. I remember going to my first fire college at IFSI, where I went from class to class, amazed at what I'd heard, and what I saw, but most importantly, what I did. Chief officers from some of the largest fire departments in the country. Some described the basic engineering concepts behind the benefits of going interior on every fire while others lauded the first line to the front of the fire every single time, regardless of where that was. Then you go to see watch company officers showing the mechanics of the hands-on techniques built on years of experience, proudly teaching us what they'd learned through blood and sweat and tears. Of course, they weren't teaching engineering or mechanics courses, but they were teaching engineering and mechanics as they applied in the real world. After years of training in college, working through pristine mathematical derivations and working in clean rooms, it was great to get out again and get my hands dirty. But most importantly, to see how mechanics and engineering principles actually apply. And while IFSI was in some ways like other state training academies across, this, across North America, it was also very much like Wilbs. There was a demand for action-oriented research, focusing on the needs of the fire service, and most importantly, driven by the fire service. So the fire department instructors in the state of Illinois, they fixed it. In doing so, they ensured that research and science and engineering are a critical pillar of the education and training of firefighters in Illinois for the past several decades. So then it would not have been a surprise to see Denise Smith walking down the hall and talking about these incredible studies and the mechanics of how a human body works in the fire service and how research can help reduce some of those risks. But even more so, to look back into the history and realize that IFSI's fire college was led by a gentleman by the name of Loring Provine from 1931 to 1950. And he presented at FDIC, the 8th FDIC, a class called the Fireman as a Scientist in 1936. He continued to present for several years, but about 11 years later, another one, Headaches in Modern Construction at the 19th FDIC in 1947. There's a strong history. To understand this, it was great to realize that Wilbs Fix-It Shop, IFSI, was much like Wilbs Fix-It Shop, but it was that way on steroids. These people were not only the mechanics who could fix any problem, electrical, mechanical, or plumbing, but they understood and applied basic engineering concepts, and most impressively, they could do it in an emergency, with smoke obscuring the vision, limited ability to communicate, and chaotic events all around them. And oh boy, those tools. From a mechanics perspective, firefighters had the coolest tools in the history of the world. So I was hooked. But I also quickly found out in my first trip to Indianapolis, the same thing can be said about FDIC. Each year, we can be reinvigorated by the education, the entertainment, the camaraderie that we find here. And the legacy of influence is from so many of the legends who have impacted both FDIC and IFSI, dating as far back as Provine, Fetters, and others, but more recently, Fredericks, Norman, Lasky, Hoff, Horvath, and Van Dorp, and so many more, whose instructing and teaching innovations have lasted an impression on our hallways in Illinois, as well as those here at FDIC. But I want to remind us all to think that while we can and should Drop the names of the FDIC legends who continue to influence us in this great profession. 
These are the giants whose shoulders upon which we stand. We should never forget the names of those who provided that first break to help us start the story. I know personally, if Wilbert Westerman hadn't fixed a fire service need in his community, I would have never have heard of these others who have impacted us here today. It's also important as a group that we realize that there are more kids from somewhere each day being born, growing, and entering our profession. Mom and pop shops like Wilbs are fewer and farther between. Kids don't have as many opportunities to get their hands dirty as mechanics at a young age. Your next response, your influence, might be the one that provides them with that initial break or reinvigorates that passion for those who had that initial break. And this is important not just for those of, those of the next generation who will be firefighters, but also the next generation of leaders in industry, in science, in engineering, in politics, in economy, and in medicine. We can influence these individuals each day. And that's one of the great privileges of working at IFSI as part of the University of Illinois is to work with some of these great young minds that are here today that will shape our futures. Even if they never join the fire service, we can influence those leaders to understand the risks and challenges that we face. And they can design a better world for us as well as that population that we're sworn to protect. We need them. We need to influence them so they can help eventually help to support us. Which leads me to my last big break, at least in my story today. And that's to have support. Support from home, support from IFSI, support from Savoy to pursue this passion with a passion. And support can come from many different places. A workplace that encourages a lifetime of learning and continu continuously reinvigorating the spirit. Or a family, a family that helps ground you in the truly important things in this world. So I'd like to share two pieces of artwork that my children produced years ago when I was about the same age as when I was introduced to Wilbs Fix-It Shop. These are the first things that I see every morning when I get into my office and the last things I look at before I leave each day. They keep me centered and focused. The first is from my boy Hudson. It says, when I grow up, I want to be a fireman. My dad is a fireman. Now I believe there's little, I believe there is no greater respect that a son can pay his dad than to want to follow in his footsteps. Even if he's only six at the time, we'll see if he's that cute now he's almost a teenager. <laughs> but I wanted to take a step back and put some context on this drawing. I'm fortunate to be able to spend some time with my boy both at IFSI and around the station at Savoy. And my full-time job is about as cool as it gets. To roughly paraphrase my job description, they pay me to burn stuff, I get paid to break things. We'll switch it up to burn stuff and break things at the same time. And we spend a lot of time generally torturing the good folks who come from across the country to participate in our studies. And through it all, I get to work with some of the coolest people from around the world, the most respected firefighters and some of the most accomplished academics. I can't imagine a job description that a six-year-old boy would be most stoked about. But that doesn't resonate with the youth of this world like the job of a firefighter does. There's no companion piece to this work of art with me standing in the lab, donning a white coat, holding a clipboard and a small pencil saying, when I grow up, I want to be an engineer. My dad is an engineer. And it's not likely to happen anytime soon. But he's got it right. See, the fact is this research enterprise, it exists to support the fire service, not the other way around. This is a reality that sometimes can get lost in translation. Next piece I'd like to share is from my daughter, Carson. At a tender young age, she created a sticker story saying, thank you, Daddy, for saving the world. Again, there's little that can touch my heart more than my baby girl thinking her daddy's a hero. But this sticker story has to do with the job of a firefighter, not with working in a lab or on an experiment. Now, I won't shy away from it. We hope that we can save lives and make the world a better place with our studies at IFSI, along with our friends at NIOSH and Skidmore and UL and many others. We study some of the biggest health concerns in the fire service, which also happen to be important to the general population. Studying post-firefighting triggers for cardiac events, it's critical for us, but hopefully help us to understand risks for everyone. By increasing our knowledge of the fire environment, 
We hope to use that to improve how we train firefighters to make decisions, but also how the public can protect themselves in their own homes. And one of the most discussed concerns of today, how occupational exposures affect the risk for cancer. Studies extend beyond the fire ground into our daily lives and homes. Personally, the lessons I've learned from Kenny and his NIOSH team have changed my outlook on many things. See, it's been said more than once that this job is dirty, difficult, demanding, and dangerous. Studies from NIST, UL, IFSI, and NIOSH, and importantly, collectively, our own experiences have shown us that this is true today as it ever has been. And like many of you, I was and still am drawn to the fire service by the blue-collar heroes I met at places like Wilbs, at IFSI, at FDIC. The hard work, the difficult and demanding and sometimes dangerous requirements, and the chance to get a little dirty every once in a while without getting yelled at. It takes men and women of fortitude with selfless intentions to respond to and do what must be done in this reality. And this is one of the reasons why the fire service is so admired by generations in the past as well as those still to come. But once the difficult, demanding, and dangerous was fixed and the job was done, it hasn't always been much of a priority for us to take care of the dirty that remains. And now, thanks to what I've learned from Kenny, I try to make it a priority to get rid of the dirty as quickly as possible once the dangerous and demanding is gone. Now, some of you agree with that, others, don't really say why the fuss, but it's important to me for several reasons. In particular, the most important reason is for them, for my next generation. I want to pay back that support that they've given me by being there for them, to see how their stories play out, to help reinvigorate their passion when it might wane, and to help them value a lifetime of service in whatever form that'll take, to hopefully provide the breaks that they will need as their futures unfold. See, we all have many more lessons left to learn and to offer. And just as important as the story that led us to FDIC here today is to realize that for most of us, our stories are far from complete. So I'd like to close with probably my favorite fire service movie quote of all time. From the closing scenes of Brotherhood, Life in the FDNY, leader in their proby school, Lieutenant Pete Christomilos, is encouraging the young recruits and he tells them to think about how their stories will be written. And he says, one day you'll be old, you'll be frail, and you'll be slow. And someone will ask you, what did you do in your day? What did you do in your prime when you were young and you were strong and you were fast? Well, not all of us will have the fortune to be New York City firemen. But because you're willing to get the job done in your community, in the face of the dirty, the difficult, the demanding, and dangerous. And because every day you inspire the next generation to see more in themselves than they see at places like Wilbs Fix-It Shop. Ladies and gentlemen, when the day is done and the page is turned, that will be enough. Thank you very much. I couldn't think to have a better partner with me for one moment if you'd wait a second and see this. I have in my hand, uh, in memory of Alan Bruno Brunacini, and in memory of Steve Alk. This table, Steve Alk was the firefighter, the chief officer who found this table for us that served for so many years for Alan to sit at, and Tommy to sit at, and John to sit at. And share their wisdom and knowledge. This plaque will be where Alan always sat. If you'd place it there, Chief. This one was for Steve. We're gonna put that one right here, where Tommy sat. And I couldn't think of a better person to do it than the man who's saving thousands of lives, setting the example, and leading the way, Chief Horn. Thanks.